Neurocognitive Disorders, Topic 1, Dr. Sarah Gleason, Department of Psychiatry and Human Behavior. This is a case study in delirium offered from the Consultation Liaison Psychiatry perspective. Our patient is a 58-year-old woman with a past medical history of thyroid disease, diabetes, and anxiety. She presents to the emergency room with chief complaints of shortness of breath and cold-like symptoms. Family says she was unable to refill some of her home prescriptions while the pharmacy was closed during a recent holiday weekend. Moreover, she has not been to her primary care doctor in quite some time and is behind on her routine lab monitoring. On exam, she is inattentive and oriented only to self. She becomes severely agitated and sees rats and babies crawling on the floor. Per family, at baseline, she patient lives alone and manages all of her affairs independently. There's no concern for dementia or other baseline cognitive impairment. Her physical exam is notable for coarse breath, breath sounds, elevated pulse of 130. She's tachypnic with a respiratory rate of 30. She has a fever of 101.4, and her O2 stats are concerningly low at 85%. Her lab shows that she is influenza A positive. As an aside, this case occurred prior to the COVID-19 pandemic, but for purposes of our discussion today, let's assume we've also screened her for COVID and she's negative. Her urine drug screen is negative. We don't see evidence of drugs of abuse, nor do we see that any evidence that she is currently has any alprazolam in her system. Her TSH is markedly low and free T4 is very high. Glucose is 476, also very elevated. Her prescription monitoring uh, program review shows that she has been receiving monthly prescriptions for alprazolam, one milligram, three times a day for the past three years. She has refilled this on a regular basis and has only recently had the interruption in prescription due uh, to pharmacy's closure on the holiday. Let's review the DSM-5 criteria for delirium. The DSM or Diagnostic and Statistical Manual of Mental Disorders, fifth edition, uh, describes the following criteria. Delirium requires a disturbance in attention and awareness that develops over a short period of time and is a change from baseline and tends to fluctuate in severity. There's also disturbance in cognition. The above changes are not better explained by an existing neurocognitive disorder or reduced level of arousal. There is evidence from history, exam, or lab that the disturbance is a direct physiological consequence of a medical condition, intoxication, or withdrawal. We specify if the delirium is substance intoxication delirium, substance withdrawal delirium, medication-induced, delirium due to another medical condition, or delirium due to multiple etiologies. As discussed in the neurology modules recently, delirium can be hyperactive, hypoactive, or mixed level of activity. What are the possible causes of delirium in our case study? Choices are A, influenza, B, thyroid storm, C, alprazolam withdrawal, D, hyperglycemia, or E, all of the above. In our case, the answer is E, all of the above. Patient meets DSM-5 criteria for delirium due to multiple etiologies. There is evidence from the history physical exam or lab that the delirium has more than one etiology. In our case, there is evidence for the four items we discussed previously. The medical team begins uh, aggressive medical management of the influenza, thyroid condition, and diabetes. Yet the patient remains agitated and psychotic. She's placed in four point restraints to prevent falls and removal of medical lines. The medicine team consults psychiatry for treatment recommendations. To review, the hallmark of delirium is impaired attention. It develops in short time over hours to days. There is a fluctuating course, disturbance in cognition, for example, orientation and memory. It's very common in general hospital patients and in post-op patients. Predisposing factors for delirium are older age, cognitive impairment, and pre-existing brain disease. 
sleep-wake disturbance is common. Visual hallucinations are frequent in delirium and more common actually than in schizophrenia. Tactile hallucinations in a clouded sensorium are almost invariably due to delirium. Delirium may be the first sign of a neurocognitive disorder. Sundowning can occur in dementia or delirium. It's often challenging to distinguish dementia from delirium and they can co-occur. We'll talk more about this in the next module. Keep in mind that you should not newly diagnose dementia in the presence of a delirium. The best treatment for delirium is prevention. Identify vulnerable patients, those with cognitive impairment, those with hearing impairment, those with visual impairment, post-op patients. It's important to look for medical causes. Urinary tract infections are a common cause of delirium. Non-pharmacological measures for managing delirium include orientation protocols, cognitive stimulation, facilitation of sleep, minimal use of physical restraints, and visual and hearing aids to enhance communication. What are the pharmacological considerations in managing delirium? Well, there are many medications that we should avoid if possible. Very broad list of medications to avoid, but it's frequently not possible to avoid all as the benefits of treatment of underlying medical etiology may outweigh the risks of certain medication use. Avoid when possible benzodiazepines, but we're going to discuss exceptions, as in this case. Avoid, when possible, opioids. But obviously, in a post-operative patient where pain control is essential, opioids can uh, not always be avoided. Calcium channel blockers, antihistamines, and other classes of medications that are high risk for delirium uh, should also be avoided if possible. Now, benzodiazepines, we use them actually to treat delir delirium when we have uh, benzodiazepine or alcohol withdrawal. So in this case, our patient is going through uh, alprazolam or Xanax withdrawal. So it's important that we reintroduce uh, that uh, to avoid serious consequences of that withdrawal. However, we try to avoid benzodiazepines in other scenarios because they can worsen confusion and sedation. Our patient's general medical condition begins to improve, but she remains intermittently confused, agitated, and psychotic. The medical team makes efforts to avoid meds that could contribute to delirium. A bedside sitter and family members attempt to reorient the patient, but the attempts to remove restraints have still been unsuccessful. So which of the following is FDA approved for treatment of delirium? A, haloperidol, B, risperidone, C, quetiapine, D, olanzapine, or E, none of the above? The answer is E, none of the above. Choices A, B, C, and D are antipsychotics, and we do see antipsychotics frequently used in management of delirium. It's important to keep in mind that they are not FDA approved, though. In fact, there are no FDA approved medications for treatment of delirium. We use antipsychotics uh, often um, to treat severe agitation in patients with delirium, largely because more effective FDA approved alternatives are not available. In summary, to manage delirium, avoid factors that can cause or aggravate delirium, treat the underlying acute illness, provide supportive and restorative care, when appropriate, use pharmacologic agents to accomplish the above object objectives.